Hollywood. It evokes images of glamour and grandeur and premieres and movie stars, right? The red carpet, which I'm on now. But what is it really? It's a business. It's an industry, like any other industry, and it's subject to change. Change in consumer tastes, change in technology. And people come to me all the time and they say, Frank, with this changing business, and how do I get in? How do I become a millionaire in Hollywood? How do I make it? And I say, it's really quite simple. If you want to become a millionaire in Hollywood, I'll tell you the secret. It can be done. You arrive in Hollywood with one billion dollars. You, in <laughs> you invest it in film, and you will be a millionaire before you know it. <laughs> you see, a lot of people make their fortunes in Hollywood, like I saw that Cecil B. DeMille building out there, and a lot of people spend their fortunes in Hollywood. But why? You know, if you look back at the history of Hollywood, in the old days, you had Howard Hughes. He came to Hollywood to make movies. I'm, I'm sure you young people know who he is. And Joe Kennedy, he came to Hollywood. Nowadays, you have the likes of like Ron Burkle and Larry Ellison. They're investing in Hollywood. Why? Do they want to rub elbows with the stars and walk on the red carpet? I don't think that's it. I think, in fact, it's that they're entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs look for change, because change creates opportunity, right? And Hollywood is in constant change. And these entrepreneurs come here and they, roll, and they say to themselves, this is a great place for me to get in and make some money. But you see, the first early years of Hollywood, the first 50 years, from 1900 to post-World War II, the only change was the movie studios were making money, money, money. There really wasn't much of a competition in those days. There were five major studios in those days. You probably recognize the names. There was MGM, and for the older folks here, MGM was the glamour studio. I mean, that was Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz. And that's what the other studios, you know, aspired to be. And there was Warner Brothers and 20th Century Fox and Universal and Paramount. You recognize the names. But in those days, it was a little different because the studios in those days had the stars under contract. They were not free agents like they are today. They couldn't get $20 million a picture. They had to work for a salary. They were told what films they would be in, how many films a year. They were swapped out with other studios. So the studios were raking it in. But really, what the difference was, in those days, the studios owned the theater chains. So when you went to the movies and you paid money to see the, the film in the theater, they could control not only the content and the films they were making, but how long they were in the theaters and how long they would stay in the theaters, and it prevented small independent producers from making films and trying to get them distributed. So after World War II, there was a change in the perception, and they realized Hollywood had become a little too powerful. We saw what happened with film in Nazi Germany and, and Russia. They were making propaganda film, and it worried them. Well, what if, what if the studios just decided to make propaganda film? What if you know, this monopoly is just too big. And the government came in and told the studios, you have to give something up. And they weren't going to give up the content, so they gave up the actual theater chains. And this was the first of a one-two punch change that affected Hollywood. The second one was a new invention, a new medium that came around right after World War II. Television. Yes, there was a time when we didn't have television. And in those days, surprisingly enough, when TV first became commercially available in the 1940s, it was very expensive. Not everybody could afford it, not a middle-class family. And the TV screen was actually only six inches big. It was, of course, black and white and very snowy. And there was only about one hour of programming a day. Not very interesting. So the studios didn't think much of it, you know? They were still licking their wounds from losing the theater chains. And now, all of a sudden, there was some competition. But they thought it was just a fad. But people all of a sudden realized they could sit in the comfort of their own home with their family after dinner as a family and watch their favorite TV shows, I Love Lucy and Milton Berle and Ed Sullivan, and really just enjoy being home and you know, being with the family. And still the studios didn't embrace it. They didn't see it or they ignored it. The change was there. They could have adapted to TV, but instead they ignored it. And in fact, one studio chief, and I'm not going to say who it was, but it was a famous studio chief, said, if I so much as see a single television set on this studio lot, I will smash it, throw it through a window, and fire that person. That's what Hollywood thought of television. But all of a sudden, America changed and had an insatiable appetite for TV. And NBC and CBS started taking their radio shows and putting it on television. 
And people started watching TV like crazy, and it took off. And the studio that ignored TV suffered. Within 10 years, that studio would be sold, and the lot would be broken down for commercial development, and their films would be sold to another studio. But on the other side of town, there was a studio called Universal. And Universal is not the fabulous studio that we know today with the theme parks. It was a different studio in the early days. They made low-budget horror movies and westerns. And they were having trouble, too, because this one-two punch of first losing the theater chains and now having TV as a viable competitor and not being prepared for it really took its toll. So Universal was, believe it or not, about to go bankrupt when a group of entrepreneurs stepped in and said, there's change here, and change is opportunity. They bought Universal for 10 cents on the dollar. What do you think the first thing they did was? Create a studio tour? No, that came later. The first thing they did was embrace television, the thing that put all the studios almost out of business. They embraced it. Universal became the premier television producer for Hollywood. They used, utilized the back lot to make westerns for television, like Bonanza and those kind of shows. And then the sound stages, they weren't using them for film, so they utilized the sound stages uh, to make sitcoms and things like that. And all of a sudden, within a 10-year period, the studio that wasn't taken seriously in town became a powerhouse. And the studio that was considered the glamour house ceased to exist in, the, in, in a big studio kind of way. So you see, change had come. And you wonder, if these studio chiefs were there, and they had all this money, and it was a, a, you know, a fruitful time, why didn't they embrace it? Because the truth is, change is hard. It comes with decisions. It comes with difficult decisions that aren't easy to make sometimes. Now, I know this firsthand because in the entertainment industry, we've gone through a lot of changes. And the company that I run is a film production company. Now, the difference between a film production company and a studio is we make the film, right? And then we partner with the studio to get it to the theaters, to get it on television, to get it onto home video. Well, in 2008, we had an economic meltdown in this country, and nothing we had seen since the Great Depression. Now, during the Great Depression, the movie industry flourished because there was no competition. There was nothing else to do. You didn't have TV. You had the radio or you go to the movies. You needed escape. But in 2008, you could stay home and watch YouTube. You could rent movies. You could, you know, do many other things that weren't available years ago for entertainment. Now, my company makes big family films like the one that you see behind me. Now, before 2008, the studios were making 25, 26 films a year. I'm not saying they were all good, but they were making a lot of films. And the box office revenue was increasing, and everybody was happy. But when the economic downturn happened, all of a sudden, box office revenue started to go down. And the studios now, no more privately held, but all publicly traded, reacted very quickly. And what they did was, they said, OK, let's cut down production. Let's release less films. So the studios went from doing 25, 26 films each a year down to eight or 10 films. Now, if you're a producer of films like my company is, and you're counting on the studios to buy those films, and they're buying a third less films, where does that leave you? Here, change presented itself. And I had to make a quick decision. How can my company continue to flourish and be viable in an industry that's changed so quickly? And it meant making very difficult decisions. It meant, you know, letting personnel go who had been there for a very long time, changes. It meant going to the studios and saying to them, instead of us spending money and developing our films and bringing them to you, why don't you show me of the six films you're releasing this year, which ones you think are a good fit for a family brand like ours, and let's partner with you. We'll help you create the vision, and we'll invest in your films. It was tough, because when you build a, a company, to, to operate one way, and all of a sudden you have to switch. You know, it's, it's a tough decision. But that's where change is. Change presents itself in very difficult ways, and you have, to, you have to work with it. Now, it's not always difficult. Remember the early 1980s? A lot of you are too young to remember, but remember home video? Remember VHS tapes? Remember going to the video store on Friday nights with your significant other or your kids, and the parking lot was jammed, and you'd be like, oh, this would have been easier to go to the movies. And you'd go in, and your favorite movie was just releasing that you wanted to see, but it was sold out. And, well, home video was booming. And by the mid-1990s, the studios, it was a cash cow again. We're in the money, you know? It was great. But change it didn't last, because what happened was, by the early 2000s, it was no longer VHS tapes. It was DVD players. 
And people said, well, wait a minute, downstairs in the, in, in the, in the basement, I've got a stack, maybe three, $4,000 worth of VHS tapes. What am I supposed to do with them now? They don't fit in that new DVD player I have. Should I replace them? I never really watch them, maybe my favorite movies. Or if I do replace them in three years, how do I know they're not going to come up with some new contraption that I can't put my DVD player in? So people got a little nervous, and they didn't spend as much on home video, right? And then 2008, the economic downturn, and change comes again. And the industry stopped because the cash cow stopped. You know, home video dropped 30%, and all the mom and pop video stores, remember those? They disappeared. Now you see empty spaces in those little mini malls as we drive by. And even companies like Blockbuster started to disappear because people weren't renting movies on a Friday night as much. Change. But companies stepped in, entrepreneurs stepped in. Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, what did they see? They saw opportunity. Well, if the mom and pop shops are going away, how are people going to get their content? So they created online subscriptions where you could go, pay one price, choose your movies, order them in the mail. I have to say, I don't know how it gets there that quickly. I choose those movies sometimes when I'm at work, and when I come home, they're in my mailbox already. I, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> And you watch it at your leisure. I do get those emails asking me if I actually got it, because sometimes they sit on the counter for two weeks. Um, and then you put it back in the envelope, and you mail it back in this prepaid envelope. And it's really quite simple. You see, change comes around, and entrepreneurs recognize change. Now, you don't have to be a visionary uh, to implement change. You just have to have your eyes wide open. Not everybody's a visionary. I don't know that I'm a visionary. But you have to be a fast follower. You have to recognize that change in your industry. You have to see it out there. You have to identify it. And you have to be able to adapt to it. You have to have a plan. Because change is inevitable. It's going to come in any business, any industry, any time in life. And you can't just pretend it's not going to happen. You have to have a plan. You have to identify. You have to plan. You have to be able to implement. And there is risk involved. Entrepreneurs recognize that. And you have to think entrepreneurially. Change is good, so you should embrace it. Thank you very much.